Well, you know, after a while, that doesn't go over too well. well. Now he's married to my daughter. What if he wants to be king instead of me? And, of course, he wasn't exactly ignorant of the promise that Samuel had given to David instead of Saul that David would be the next king, and then David was best friends with Saul's own son. See what a soap opera this thing is? And that just puts Saul over the edge. So, David finds out through Jonathan and through his, his wife that you know what, they're going to come kill him in the middle of the night. Just get rid of this problem. So he, like Paul will later be doing, he's let out through a basket outside the castle. And he goes running for his life. And you kind of know the rest of the story. He ends up going from pillar to post. It's a whole lot of stuff that happens. It's about roughly 10 years. This whole period is about 10 years. And eventually what happens is that Saul and David, they make up, and then Saul and David go their separate ways again, and then, then Saul gets real nervous and jealous and goes chasing all over Israel to try to find David, and David pretends that he's mad, and he pretends to be a bodyguard for the Philistines or to help the Philistines, and really what he's doing is killing Philistines. He's killing one group of Philistines who are angry at another group of Philistines. So the w group of Philistines he seems to be favoring don't recognize what he's doing. Meanwhile, he's clearing out all the enemies of Israel. Eventually, the Philistines and Saul end up fighting each other at the Battle of Mount Gilboa. And... Saul dies. The guy who knows that Saul dies gets all excited about it, thinking he'll get a reward, takes his crown, goes running to David. And David's not so happy about that. Orders the guy killed. You see how much violence we're talking about? A lot of it. All the while, a whole bunch of people have been assembling on David's side. And all the while, David was consulting God using the priest who wore the ephod with the two shiny stones on his shoulders to hold the, the two, you know, it was kind of like a billboard that was held together at the shoulders with stones, two stones. Yes, no. Urim and Thummim. No, yes. Okay. And then the 12 stones in front for which tribe of Israel was to be assigned for whatever the question was. He was always going to God, do I fight this one or this one? God was telling him who to fight. God was telling him who to war with. God had already anointed him king, and that's what a king ought to do is fight. So he was learning on the job how to be a king before he was a king. So, when that guy brings that crown to him, the first thing David does is order the guy killed. And he makes a lot of orders like that. <clears throat> There's a seven-year civil war that ensues. He's crowned king of Hebron after Saul died. By the people at Hebron, they name him king, but the rest of Israel wasn't united behind him yet. Mephibosheth was still alive. That was the son of Jonathan. And uh, there was this sort of civil war. It was a half-hearted civil war because they also wanted to get, the, get rid of the Philistines. So they, they sort of fought with each other and sort of didn't. But most of the time they were fighting against other Philistines and they just sort of, you know, tried to have a sort of uneasy peace, see if they could resolve it some other way. But in the final analysis, they defeated most of the Philistines for a while. And a couple of things, major things happened that produced a, a rapprochement on the one hand and on the other hand got rid of some of the bad guys 
that were trying to keep the Civil War going. So that David ended up being um, sort of in charge, and then the final, the final straw was taking Jerusalem away from the Jebusites. We were a bunch of people who were against the Jews for a long time. And uh, that made David crown king over all Israel at that point. He was 37 years old when he was crowned king over all Israel, 30 years old when he was crowned at Hebron. And why am I telling you this long story? I'm trying to show you that God told him he's going to become a king. God told him to fight. God told him when and where to fight using lighted stones. He had to fight his own king. He had to fight the Philistines. He had to pretend to be one thing and yet be another thing. He went through this thing and that thing and the other thing and the, the nation went to him and they split between the two and this went on and on and on and on and on. For a total of about 15 years. 13, 15 years, somewhere in that vicinity because he was 30 when he was crowned to Hebron. So God was in that. Fighting. Now, of course, after he's king over all Israel, he's still got some more fighting to do. And he does a bunch of it. But there ends up being a sort of a lull. Which brings us to 2 Samuel 7. Which is the point of this audio. 2 Samuel 5 is a civil war. So I'm going to pick up in the next increment at 2 Samuel 7. So here's David, he's finally gotten a break after, oh, I don't know, 20, no, 20, 25 years of warring constantly. From the time he's a teenager and he hit, the, he hit Goliath with that stone. And he's finally in Jerusalem, he's finally building his own city, and his own son, Nathan the prophet, who's going to end up being the progenitor of Messiah. His own son is a prophet with Gad to David. And when God has something to say, he either says it directly to David, which obviously the Psalms record he did many times, but he also goes through official channels. His own son, who's going to be the progenitor of Messiah, is one of those channels. Oh. Nathan, he says to Nathan, you know, I'm really, this is wonderful. I'm finally at rest. All those years of worrying. I have this really nice house now. I have all these wives and kids. Oh. Because David was polygamous, baby. I have this really nice house, but how come the Lord's still in a tent? Now, pretend you're God. Of course, you foreknow everything about what you intend to do. Here's this guy who in many ways is a hothead, in many ways is a ladies' man, in many ways is, you know... Not exactly the kind of person that you would pick to be the progenitor of Messiah. And he's the only guy since Moses who cared about the house for the ark, which represented Christ to come. First ark, Noah, second ark, Moses, third ark, the ark. Christ is the temple, the temple depicts, and now David wants to build that temple. That's, that's got to be really rare and really a surprise. All those holy people all that time. 
they just let the Ark be at Shiloh or wherever it was. How many people were learning scripture? Not very many. I mean, you saw the book of Judges. But here is this king who feels bad about having a nice home because how come God doesn't have one? And since the Mosaic Law and practically everything else in the Old Testament is tongue-in-cheek, how do you think, how would you reply? Nathan, I want you to tell David that, you know, I made you who you are. You were just tanning sheep. Did I ever ask you to give me a home? Didn't I give you a home? Did I ever ask you to give me a place where I can rest my bones? What can contain me? So, you're not going to build me a house. I'm going to build you one. Now, you got to understand the, 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 the funniness of that. Because, and, and the Lord of all people will, will play on this in John 14. House means a house, a royal house. It's not just talking about some stones hung up together with cement. It's talking about a bloodline. A house of sons, the house of Hanover, the house of Windsor. Okay, that's what, what house means more than anything else. Bloodline, that's what Christ is talking about. In my house are many mansions, we say in English. Totally missing the point. Sons. That's Isaiah 53.10. You're not going to give me a house, honey. I'm going to give you one house that's a building, too. And then about, oh, I don't know, maybe 30% of the Old Testament is spent on the description of that house. How it's built down to the very, the very carving of the pomegranates. Don't you ever wonder why God goes into so much detail for a house he seems to not want in Second Samuel 7? Oh, well, you can't get, what, you're going to build me a house? You can't contain me, yeah. And then he spends like, I don't know, how many chapters are there in in Kings and, and uh, Chronicles and in Ezekiel in particular about all of the construction of the temple? I mean, God spends a lot of text on that. So, if he really didn't want a house, why is he so persnickety about the details? Right down to how long and how high and whether there's a hand breadth. This is where all the atheists get all confused. There's a hand breadth of difference in the width of, the thickness of, the bath. Therefore, pi is not three. It's three before you count the hand breadth. I mean, God tells them the exact dimensions of everything, whether you coat it with gold or silver, whether you use bronze or how many candlesticks and how high and how many pomegranates are there going to be on each pillar. You'd think God was a control freak. So did God not want a house? No, he wanted one very badly. You're going to build me a house already. There's not a house that can contain me. Oh, I'm so secretly pleased you asked this. And I'm not only going to give you a house with all the, the trimmings that, that that's going to be an ancient wonder of the world. I'm going to give you a house of sons that will always be king. Ending up with the king of kings already. That Second Samuel 7 promise, it went to David. Why? Well, because Israel had already rejected God as king back in 1050 B.C. 
And then Saul rejected God as being God over Saul. And even went so far as to consult a medium. So Israel got grafted in through David. Second Samuel 7, go look it up yourself. That's the background for David. Sorry it took me so long to get there, but you see the background? Fight, 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 fight. <gasps> I finally have peace. I finally have this nice house. Get that. Second Samuel 7, go look it up. I finally have peace and rest. I finally have a nice house. But what is God getting for all this? And so what does God say? This is so typical. Oh, you want to build me a house? Okay, well, I tell you what you should do. Lift up your feet a little. Have some rest. You've shed enough blood already. I'll name your son Solomon, which means reconciliation, meaning peace, meaning prosperity. And he'll do the work. You don't have to do any work anymore. You've done enough. Oh. I mean, go look at the text yourself. When God talks to Nathan, he doesn't say anything about, oh, David shed blood. He's not allowed to build my house. God doesn't say that. Where are the words in that text, in that context? When he's talking to Nathan, telling Nathan what Nathan should say to David. What is he saying there? Hi, you were, a, you were a, a shepherd. I brought you and I made you king. So now I'll make you a house. That's what he said. But David, three times, and the passages will be in the video description. And then Solomon once, David might have only said it twice, but I think it's three times. The text will be in the video description. Three times or twice at least, David says, and then Solomon himself says, and what is it, First Kings 5 something. Well, God said that I'd shed blood, so my son's going to build the house. Now, here's the kicker. Here's the punchline. My son's name is Solomon. Shalom. Shalmin. Peace. Do two. Reconciliation. Therefore, prosperity. And that's what God did say. And therefore, the, your son will have peace his entire reign. In other words, because David did the warring, his son will have the peace. It's due to cross before crown. You war and then you rest. You war and then you rest. And as an award to David, award, his son will have the peace. It is David's legacy that his son gets the peace. David did the work. His son gets the benefit. Christ does the work. We're his sons. We get the benefit. Everybody's a son of Christ the same way Abraham was. Genesis 15, 6. You believe in Christ, that he paid for your sins and you're saved. He did the work. He did the warring. He shed the blood. And we get the peace. We get the benefit. So now, let me ask you. When David's quoting God, obviously delighted to do so, he just well, see, God said I, I'd shed blood, so my son has to do it. <laughs> I wanted to build a temple. Yeah, I wanted to work even more for God because I'm so in love with him. I can't stand it. I don't want to stop working. But God says stop working already. Your son is going to do the work in a time of peace. So... And this is something scholars don't know because they don't do their homework. I'm sorry. 
The last seven years of David's life from age 70 to 77, he spent getting stuff ready for the temple. He designed the priestly courses. He designed the Psalms. He designed the a lot of the, what do you want to call it, the, the way the service works. Just read it yourself, First Chronicles 22 and following. That's what David did. While Solomon ruled, because David retired at 70 and died at age 77, and I spent time proving that in my Patu videos, Pauline Anaphora Timeline Update. It shows the entire Bible timeline going back to Adam because Paul is using the meter in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 to show how church reconciles Israel. How Israel will be reconciled through church and therefore the tribulation is pre-trib, uh, the rapture is pre-trib because that promise vests in Christ and then the millennium thereafter. All of the timeline in the Bible centers on first David to last David. And Isaiah 53 is there for 177 syllables because that's the number of years from the birth of the first David to the death of the last David. So Paul centers Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 on it. Using two anaphora, three anaphora actually. Eudokion and Pinon and finally what I call Temple Trio. Ending with... Um, which means first fruits. That's a, a handful of grain. Handful of grain you pick up out of the ground. You, you root it up out of the ground. You wave it before God. And it's just a handful. There will only be a handful of Christians who make it to be kings in the winter of church, which started, the winter of church, started with Constantine and has been going on ever since. I didn't write the Bible. I didn't write the meter. I documented it. You can watch those videos if you want. But no matter what you think about it, isn't it pretty obvious now that when God says to David, you're not building the house, he's not condemning him or chiding him or punishing him. He's saying it's time for you to rest. You've done enough. Peace out.